Um, my name is Betsy Baton, Elizabeth Baton. I'm at Emerson College. I am very pleased uh, that Larry asked me to do commentary today and to uh, moderate this session. I had a, it was great reading uh, Jess's paper and John's uh, paper and then wrestling with those uh, papers as I tried to put some shape uh, to my responses to them. Uh, so why don't we uh, begin? First, I'll ask everyone to mute their microphones and to keep it muted until called on uh, for a question or a comment during our Q&A session. Also, um, we will have you put your questions and comments uh, in chat. If you could hold off on that uh, until the end of the presentations. Uh, I'll be the only one to uh, see uh, your names, so put, be sure to put your, um, your names in the chat, uh, as well as the person to whom you're directing your question. So I'm sure you all know uh, Jessica Wallman and John Sturr, um, Jess and John, uh, both at Emory, of course. Uh, so I'm not going to go into their uh, CVs right now. I'm sure they'll provide those for you, uh, perhaps for a small fee. Uh, so I've asked Jessica uh, to go first. So Jess, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. And um, let me just stress, it's fine. You don't have to, if you have a comment or question for me, you don't have to write the whole thing in the chat. You can just put your name in the queue and, and that, will, that will suffice. But otherwise, yeah, it's perfect. Okay, I'm just going to do a, a sort of summary version of the paper and talk about the, the salient points. The title being, Are Naturalism and Metaphysics Contradictory? So why do I ask that question? Well, the basis uh, for the question is George Santayana's claim in his review of experience in nature that, which is done, John Dewey's experience in nature, of course, that naturalism and metaphysics seem contradictory. In his words, he says, in what sense is Dewey's naturalistic metaphysics naturalistic? In what sense is it metaphysical? How comes it that these two characters, which to me seem contradictory, can be united in this philosophy?" End quote. So the difference between naturalism and metaphysics for Santayana, I want to assert, is primarily an issue of temperaments. More specifically, naturalism and metaphysics express ex opposing attitudes about the relation between human intelligence and natural existence. Santayana sees in naturalism a humility regarding our epistemological powers and capacities, and in metaphysics, or as I will show, a certain form of metaphysics, an arrogant assimilation of existence into human conceptual frameworks. Santayana's characterization of the temperamental opposition between naturalism and metaphysics is in actuality indicative of an argument between naturalism and humanism, where the former is said to minimize human significance in re relation to nature, while the latter inflates it. Once metaphysics is equated with humanistic temperament, there cannot by this light be a truly naturalistic metaphysics. This is because instead of treating nature as the ultimate reality of which we humans are a part and within which we are ultimately subsumed, the humanistic metaphysician reduces nature to a mere implement in the service of human life, or as Santayana puts it, to a story. So in short, naturalism presents a sufficiently humble attitude while metaphysics is arrogant in its anthropocentrism. So you, to those of you who are in the last session see where I'm coming from. So this distinction between naturalism and metaphysics is reminiscent of the tension between naturalism and humanism. And from this, two conclusions can be drawn. One, Santayana is wrong, that naturalism and metaphysics are incompatible for many things that we would count as metaphysics would not be considered humanistic. And two, some naturalisms are actually more humanistic in Santayana's sense in that they equate nature with human scientific constructions. So those are the two conclusions I'm going to arrive at here. So first, naturalism versus metaphysics in Santayana's uh, opinion. Santayana first explains his own sense of naturalism as implying a philosophical rendition of commonplace beliefs about the existing world. The everyday natural attitude treats reality as made up of substantial entities and processes that have the power to affect us and one another in various ways. And its philosophical version describes and catalogs nature's salient features as a meaning of coming to terms with them and with one's place in the broader scheme of things. According to naturalism then, 
the objects one comes across are taken to be things in their own right rather than mere objects for the experiencer. Though a naturalist philosophy may describe subjective conditions and empirical objects and even treat them as real in some sense, thus naturalism need not imply reductionism, any quote, immaterial things which are recognized shall be regarded as names, aspects, functions, or concomitant products of those physical things among which action goes on. A naturalist may distinguish his own person or self, provided he identifies himself with his body and does not assign to his soul any fortunes, powers, or actions, save those of which his body is the seat and organ, end quote. So essentially, the aspect of naturalism that renders it incompatible with metaphysics for Santayana is its refusal to grant causal power to subjective existence and its ideal or phenomenal objects. Naturalism treats the physical world as substantial and experience as ultimately rooted in and generated by physical substances, substances and their processes. So here's what he does to Dewey. Santayana asserts that naturalism will quote, break down however, so soon as words, ideas, or spirits are taken to be substantial on their own account and powers at work prior to the existence of their organs or independent of them. Now it is precisely such disembodied powers and immaterial functions prior to matter that are called metaphysical, end quote. So metaphysics, according to Santayana, turns ephemeral ideas into things, giving them both power and weight that he thinks they cannot be said to possess, and thus, quote, to admit anything metaphysical in this sense is evidently to abandon naturalism, end quote. It is clear then that Santayana reserves the term metaphysics for a particular interpretation of reality, or rather a particular kind of focus on and appropriation of it. He labels this emphasis a dominance of the foreground and claims that, uh, quote, if such a foreground becomes dominant in a philosophy, naturalism is abandoned, end quote. By foreground, Santayana means, quote, that which is relative to some chosen point of view, to the station assumed in the midst of nature by some creature tethered by fortune to a particular time and place, end quote. In other words, to the way that some aspect of nature is experienced by a living being. Attention to the foreground is not by itself a commitment to metaphysics, for the way things seem to individuals is the subject matter of many a gifted poet and literary figure, and a naturalist thinker may well be given to express her own sense of nature's appearing. The foreground becomes dominant, and the philosophy metaphysical, only when the human point of view is treated as ultimate. So if metaphysics is equated with a hypostatization of that which is immaterial, there can be, by definition, no materialist metaphysics. So in my next section on natural humi humility and humanistic hubris, here's how Santayana treats of temperaments. According to Santayana, the naturalist, quote, treats the inner processes of matter with respect and not with transcendental arrogance, end quote. The arrogance of metaphysics, according to Santayana, lies in the illusion that the world is a friendly home for human interests. Humanists, quote, can henceforth believe they are living in a moral universe that changes as they change with no sky lowering over them, save a portable canopy which they carry with them on their travels, end quote. Quoting again, naturalists, however, heartily despising the foreground have fallen in love with the greatness of nature and have sunk speechless before the infinite, end quote. So the modest naturalist, in other words, rel recognizes her relative insignificance when compared to the immense scope of natural existence. Naturalism sees us as latecomers on a small planet in an unimaginatively, va unimaginably vast universe that is largely indifferent to our or to anything's welfare. The world is not our home and is not wedded to our way of seeing things. As Santayana notes, and I quote, nature laughs at our dialectic and goes on living in her own way, end quote. John Dewey now in his response to the review of his book notes Santayana's focus on temperament and correctly observes that Santayana thinks Dewey's empiricism makes him a speculative egotist. Dewey responds with the rejoinder, quote, that Santayana is confident that a wholehearted naturalism is inarticulate, a kneeling before the unknowable and an abjuration of all that is human, end quote. So in an ironic twist, Dewey accuses Santayana of separating human life from nature and of making subjective experience effectively unnatural. From Dewey's point of view then, Santayana's naturalism entails an utter dismissal of human concerns and a surrender in adoration of that which cannot be understood. The humanist is not an arrogant narcissist. Instead, Santayana is a bowing and scraping penitent to a transcendent deity. 
Okay, so I said there would be two conclusions from all this. My conclusion one is Santayana is wrong. He has a strategic characterization of metaphysics. His characterization is a philosophy of metaphysics as a philosophy of the foreground in which experience and its objects become hypostatized also exposes the fact that the object of Santayana's criticism is not speculative philosophy in general, but more specifically German idealism and its offshoots. That Santayana is aiming at transcendentally oriented philosophies is evinced by the fact that he identifies as quote, natural philosophy, other ostensibly metaphysical positions, such as those of Spinoza, the Greek naturalists, and even Indian mysticism. These sorts of systems, thanks to their denigration of the foreground, amount to speculative insight about the natural world and are not metaphysics, but cosmology. By contrast, Santayana claims that a dominant foreground, quote, has always been the source of metaphysics and is the soul of transcendentalism and also of empiricism, which I think these are very odd bed bedfellows. We have the odd bedfellows of metaphysics and its apparent arsonist empiricism placed together here. So must naturalism be opposed to humanism? In actuality, matters are not quite as either Santayana or Dewey have made them appear. The concepts naturalism and humanism are not so easily teased apart. It's probably not the case that humanists are egomaniacs, nor naturalists shame face sycophants. And in the end, Dewey's naturalist metaphysics is not actually self-contradictory. There are naturalistic humanisms and humanistic naturalisms. There are assertions that humanism and naturalism are fundamentally opposed and that they fall together uh, and failing to acknowledge the truths of supernaturalism. So this isn't a logical incompatibility so much as a temperamental approach to doing philosophy in the first place. Uh, the difference in emphasis is real, but as often happens, the smallest point of contention between largely sympathetic positions has become the most furious of battlegrounds. Conclusion number two, scientism is humanistic. Even if Santayana hasn't exposed metaphysics as contradictory to naturalism, he may have given us the means to criticize the scientism that often goes by the term naturalism in academic circles today. And as we saw criticized by DeCaro yesterday, even though contemporary mostly analytic naturalism tends to reject humanism as insuffici insufficiently attentive to physical facts, his own focus on human interpretations of nature in the form of scientific discoveries and inventions and its equation of those discoveries with nature itself puts contemporary naturalism at odds with Santayana's sense of naturalist cosmology and makes it vulnerable to his accusations of humanistic hubris. As Santayana notes, quote, science is a part of human discourse and necessarily poetical like language, end quote. As a result, one should not confuse his own philosophical language about nature with the technological terminology of the sciences. Even though Santayana claims that scientists give more systematic accounts of natural behavior than do philosophers, he insists that a naturalistic philosopher be attentive to the partial, interpretive, and fallible that is the human nature of scientific practices and conclusions. In failing to do so, one could argue that many of today's academic naturalists in their singular focus on scientific knowledge and their equation of scientific theories with natural philosophy are far more humanist than they realize. And so my ultimate conclusion in this essay, I've aimed to show how Santayana's naturalism distinguishes itself from some forms of metaphysics and humanism and from all forms of scientism. His natural cosmology may be metaphysical in the general sense of being speculative, and so naturalism and metaphysics need not be contradictory. But he successfully differentiates his position from those of dialecticians, transcendentalists, and scientific reductionists. In doing so, he probably overstates the contrast, okay, he definitely overstates the contrast between Dewey's system and his own, for both, think uh, both thinkers provide a pragmatic account of knowledge and recognize the organic origins of human subjective existence. That said, there is a distinction between Santayana's naturalism and Dewey's humanism, and it depicts the extent to which the articulation of a worldview is as much a moral endeavor as an ontological one. Speculative visions of natural conditions, whether we call them ontology, metaphysics, cosmology, or just insight, say as much about our individual psychological dispositions as they do about the structure of existence. And this overall, is perhaps what makes even natural philosophy something humane. Thank you. Thanks very much.
so we'll hold off on uh, questions again uh, until uh, John has finished, and then I have a few comments as well. Uh, so John, would you like to uh, present your summary? Sure, thank you. So hopefully this uh, shows up on your screen and this is kind of a, you know, philosophers doing technology. So we're just gonna hope for the best. So this, this is titled Plastic Naturalism and some meanings of the word is a romance in five acts. This is kind of a performance piece and so it was hard to cut down. So you can see this as kind of a romance in three acts and a couple of scenes. So I begin with two head texts here. Um, William James says, it's astonishing to see how many philosophical disputes collapse into insignificance the moment you subject them to the simple test of tracing a concrete consequence. We say that this theory solves the problem of marrying old opinion and new fact on the whole more satisfactorily than that theory, but that means more satisfactorily to ourselves and individuals will emphasize their points of satisfaction differently to a certain degree, therefore, everything here is plastic. And Santiana writes, in practice, the ambiguities of language are neutralized by looseness and good sense in the interpretation of it. But a philosopher leads himself into foolish difficulties and more foolish dogmas if he assumes that words have fixed meanings to which a single fact in nature must correspond. He ought therefore to use language more freely than the public rather than more strictly, since he professes to have a clearer view of things. So act one, act two. What do you call two metaphysicians in the same room? Hold on, there we go. What do you call two metaphysicians in the same room? A disagreement. What do you call three metaphysicians in the same room? A war. What do you call four metaphysicians in the same room? Define same. So my aim in this paper is to suggest or to exhibit and to avow a pluralistic, radically empirical metaphysics. I'm going to take nature as a case study. My aim is not to argue for or defend that claim, to somehow claim to prove that metaphysics. I hope to provide an opportunity for others to determine if this worldview resonates with or proves useful in or illuminates their own experiences. I stress, and I probably cannot stress enough, that my aim is to exhibit and to avow this worldview. And this means that it's not to defend or argue for it. It's not a defense. I take this um, view because I don't believe that it's possible to argue in a non-question begging way for any metaphysics. I do not think that philosophical presentations, essays, articles, and books by themselves ever can defend a worldview in the sense of providing evidence, much less proof of the truth of that worldview though they can rise to the defense of a worldview in the sense of declaring fellowship with it or intoning amen. I take a metaphysics to be a descriptive expression, vision, or fashion, and one offered up for your consideration. Here I am in large sympathy, or so I see it with George Santayana's declaration that his own philosophy is not metaphysical. Metaphysics in the proper sense of the word, he writes, is dialectical physics, or an attempt to determine matters of fact by means of logical, or moral or rhetorical constructions. I take all such attempts to be failures as such, if failures unrecognized by their creators and champions. And here again, I take myself to be in sympathy with Santayana, who claimed that the realms of being that he identified and named are not parts of a cosmos nor one great cosmos together, but only kinds or categories of things worth distinguishing. He added, logic like language is partly a free construction and partly a means of symbolizing and harnessing and expression the existing diversity of things. And while some languages, given a man's constitution and habits, may seem more beautiful and convenient to him than others, it's a foolish heat in a patriot to insist that only his native language is intelligible or right. I do not ask anyone to think in my terms if he prefers others. So act three, and for those of you who have actually read the paper online, you'll see that this is a lot of stuff being skipped. So I shall focus on a three-way dispute, uh, kind of three perspectives on nature. One is a realistic and non-reductive naturalism understood to be a metaphysics of being, a metaphysics that is ontological and an emergentist one. 
One, two, radical empiricism understood as a metaphysics of experience, a metaphysics that takes an experiential or phenomenological turn. And anti-realist textualism understood as concerned with vocabularies of nature and committed to the impossibility of getting behind or beneath or before language of nature to nature itself, understood as a would-be post-metaphysical or metaphysically deconstructive philosophy that takes a linguistic or semantic turn. In the longer paper, I name examples of each of these views, many of whom are at this meeting. Um, don't have time for that now, but if I left out your name and it's in the paper, I apologize. So what is nature? If the answer to the question, what is nature, depends in part on the meaning of the word nature, then equally the question, what is nature, depends on the meaning of the word is. In his some meanings of the word is, Santayana provided careful analysis and great clarity. What is nature? If we understand is in Santayana's first sense as identity or the principle of essence, then metaphysics becomes simply a registering of the obvious and the self-identical. I see what I see, it is what it is, A equals A, and so on. In this sense of is, nothing more can be said about nature and nothing more needs to be said. What is nature? Nature is nature, period. So much for the MSA theme, nature and meaning, time to head to the Zoom happy hour. If nature is, if nature's isness is claimed to be anything else at all other than identity, then the claim is not one of identity. In all such cases, one is asserting that nature is, well, not nature, but something else, something that's not self-identical to nature. In this way, all is claims that are not identity claims are metaphorical, perhaps even poetic. And so different kinds of is claims are so many different metaphors, metaphors presumably employed by different narrative artists. Um, in counterpoint to Moliere's 1670 bourgeois gentilhomme, who discovered that for 40 years he'd been speaking prose without knowing it, many philosophers, metaphysicians included, who utter more than identity claims for centuries have been telling metaphorical narratives and poetic stories without knowing it. The MSA, the Metaphorical Society of America. Now, Santiana distinguished six additional meanings of the word is, and I will focus on the last three briefly. He called them existence, actuality, and derivation. First, non-reductive naturalists who claim that there is an experience-independent nature or mind-independent existence are claiming that nature is, is real in the sense of existence and the sense of derivation. Santiana called this view an assumption, but stresses that it's an assumption forced on us by our animal faith, by our actions and expectations and the intuitions to which they give rise. He wrote that whenever one assumes that there is, that there exists a mind independent substance, one is using the word is in the sense of an assertion of existence. And he added, the assertion of existence is imposed on me antecedently by the actions or expectations in the midst of which intuition arises and without which it would never arise. And to this underlying faith is due the habit of prediction and the function of giving names. I'm compelled to believe in the butt of my action or the objects of my fears or memories, substances on which my efforts converge or from which influences radiate upon me. The vague light without color, without outline or color, which may first come to me from the church window is certainly not the composition which I afterwards discover there, yet I call them perceptions of the same thing because I'm convinced a priori by the persevering attitude of my body and other converging circumstances that a common source existed for both images, namely a single material window fixed in its place, designed by its particular architect and built by his particular masons and glaciers. If no such natural object existed, that vague light and the precise composi composition would have nothing to do with each other. This non-reductive naturalist here stands with Santayana. Nature is independent of mind. Nature exists, and nature so understood must not be identified with whatever, quote, chance intuitions any particular person might use in describing it. To take one's description of nature as nature itself is the perpetual occasion of human illusion, dogmatism, and error. This belief in the existence of nature leads Santayana to explain to another meaning of the word is that he calls derivation, that he says is the most misleading of all. For example, I perceive a point of light, say to myself, there's a spark, and so take this perception as the sign of some existence. Santiana wrote, but in the world of nature to which I am now addressed, a spark is no isolated fact, it has some origin, and so I say to myself, this spark is a firefly and not a star. And some, Santiana summed this up, I've thus traveled in search of explanation very far indeed from my datum. Instead of saying a point is a point, I first said a spark exists, and then I said the spark is an insect. 
the word is has become a synonym of comes from. It attributes to an alleged fact, a source, and another fact, asserting that the two are continuous genetically, however different they may be in character. Such claims that nature is in the sense of derivation, Santana stressed, must be taken loosely. It's not the spark is nothing but a firefly. Instead, the claim here is that in the sense of derivation, a firefly merely indicates a claimed partial origin of the particular factor idea. And here Santayana, as much as James, interestingly, was at pains to avoid what James called the intellectualist fallacy, the fallacy of taking an object to be only that which a definition of it asserts it as being. Now, in sharp contrast to the non-reductive naturalist who understands derivation as an inference of one existence, say a firefly, from another existence, say a spark, Radical empiricists view derivation as an inference from one experience to another. In his famous The Postulate of Immediate Empiricism, which I note is not a postulate of immediate naturalism, John Dewey employed a different meaning of the word is. He wrote, I start and I'm flustered by a noise heard. Empirically, that noise is fearsome. It really is, not merely phenomenally or subjectively so. That's what it's experienced as being. But when I experience the noise as a known thing, I find it to be innocent of harm. It is a tapping of the shade against the window owing to movements in the wind. The experience has changed. That is, the thing experienced has changed. Not an unreality has given place to a reality, nor that some transcendental unexperienced reality has changed. Not the truth has changed, but just and only the concrete reality experienced has changed. Here we have the being or isness of nature in a sense in which is means derivation as understood by a radical empiricist. To say the spark is a firefly, for example, is to say that one experience, say perceiving some spark a distance away, does or would lead to some subsequent other experiences, say perceiving a firefly as one walks with steady gaze nearer to the blinking spot. James has asked rhetorically, have we not explained that conceptual knowledge is made such wholly by intermediary experiences and by a terminus that fulfills? Here, the work of derivation is accomplished not by inferring that there is nature in the sense of is as experience independent existence. Instead, derivation is made possible by and is it a function of the continuity of experience of nature in the sense of actuality. Indeed, this is just how James expresses the thesis of radical empiricism that's familiar to most all of you. The relations that connect experiences must themselves be experienced relations, and any kind of relation to experience must be accounted as real as anything else. And importantly, says, though one part of our experience may lean upon another part to make it what it is in any one of several aspects in which it may be considered, experience as a whole is self-containing and leans on nothing. For the radical empiricist, James and Dewey, for example, Santayana's butt of action is other action, not action independent nature. In contrast, Santayana concluded that actualities, he calls them intrinsic incandescences, that create the world of appearances are not existences in the same sense as natural things or events. He says, yet we may say that they exist and arise unless we're willing to banish spirit from nature altogether and to forget when we do so that spirit in us is then engaged in discovering nature and in banishing spirit. Why should philosophers wish to impoverish the world in order to describe it more curtly? The spiritual hypothesis of life into intuition is therefore less and more than natural existence and deserves a different name. I will call it actuality. Is applied to spirit or to any of its modes accordingly means is actual. Here, of course, the radical empiricist poses a different question about actuality than the one asked by Santayana. For radical empiricists, the question is not why should philosophers wish to impoverish the world in order to describe it? Instead, the question is, why should naturalists wish to impoverish experience in order to transcend it? As James puts it, when we talk of reality independent of human thinking, then it seems a very hard thing to find. You can't weed out the human contribution, he added, noting that any assertion of a reality or nature independent of mind, any existence independent of experience has already been faked, that's his word, by being an assertion of independence only in and for experience. From the standpoint of tough-minded thinking, James called this a piece of perverse abstraction worship. And he observed, not being reality, but only our belief about reality, any claim to truth will contain human elements. What should we call a thing anyhow? We break the flux of sensible reality into things, then at our will, we create the subject of our true as well as our false propositions. We create the predicates to our nouns and adjectives are all humanized heirlooms. So a radical empiricist here stands with James. Nature is not independent of mind and nature. Understanding nature in the sense of actuality, nature is. Actuality does not logically force us to infer existence. It forces us to infer other actualities, other experiences. So 
in the words of William James, you see how differently people take things. Disagreement, if not war, may loom. Is this just in the end a matter of different stories? That would be exciting, different narratives. Actuality man versus existence woman. Almost everyone these days seems to love superheroes and villains and their struggles. And to further live in the plot, surely it does not seem a stretch to think of metaphysical views as the zombies of the theory world killed and buried so many times, but still apparently undead. The return of the scholastic realists, dawn of the eliminative materialists, idealist apocalypse. Or are the narrative differences between non-reductive naturalism and radical empiricism generated by different inferences? I think yes. The naturalist and the radical empiricist agree about what is in the sense of actuality. Given different experiences of the same thing, Santayana inferred a prior experience independent common source of these different experiences. That this church window is real in the sense of is, as existence is not verified by our inner experience, which as actuality can never warrant either belief or doubt in existence. And this is why Santayana called it an assumption. Given our actual experience, given our animal life, it must be inferred. Santayana inferred that it was necessary for the operations of animal faith. And here I think is the very root of every difference between naturalist and radical empiricist. The radical empiricist makes a different, yes, radically different inference. Given different experiences of the same thing, James inferred only additional experiences, actual or possible. We conclude that we saw the same object because of definite experience continuities between the two experiences. In short, it's the same church window because it's experienced as the same church window, it has the same terminus. The disagreement may appear interminable. The radical empiricist cannot prove that there's nothing independent of experience by claiming that experience provides no evidence of such existence. There's an actuality existence gap here. No amount of claims about what there is when is understood in the sense of actuality entails anything at all about the impossibility of being anything else. However, in parallel fashion, the non-reductive naturalist cannot prove that there's something independent of experience merely by claiming that experience is explained on this assumption. There is a logic fact gap here. No claim that something could be the case entails that it actually is. Attempted inference of this sort all fails because as Santayana himself pointed out, the attempt to determine matters of fact by logical constructions, dialectical physics is always invalid. As James observed, it's impossible not to see here temperamental differences at work. From the standpoint of radical empiricism, non-reductive naturalism can look like a theological and conservative temperament, a desire for a universe in which the individual is assured that there is a greater and more permanent reality. And in the past, I've called this the adoration of matter, a reality that endures even as human lives begin and end, come and go, satisfy and suffer for a little while. I suspect, however, that the radical empiricist who makes an effort to grasp this temperament on its own terms would do well to see this in large part as humility, not in the sense of having little prestige or engaging in self-abasement or taking a low view of oneself, but in the sense of having an honest view of oneself and reverence for the world. It's a temperament at odds with narcissism, hubris, conceit, and pride. It's just the sort of conceit, I believe, that Santayana finds in radical empiricism a philosophy which in his view experience, the mere foreground of nature is taken to be reality in full. Man not simply as the measure of all things, but as all things to be measured. I find some truth in this view, but I find it mostly misses the mark. The radical empiricist is committed to striving in an always unfinished world, always remade, always in the remaking by its actors. However, this temperament is not egoism, it's meliorism and the strenuous responsibility that meliorism confers in an unfinished universe. Experience leans on nothing else. There's nothing else on which to lean, only further experience. There are no guarantees and there's no nothing, there's nothing fixed or certain. The world is precarious and full of possibilities. So let me conclude. It's here that a pragmatically inclined radical empiricist in a very irritating way will point out that theories that do not have different concrete consequences are practically the same. From the standpoint of radical empiricism, so-called experience independent, existence amounts in practice simply to the continuity of experience. From the standpoint of non-reductive naturalism, of course, this practical equivalence is no real equivalence at all. It's to make matters of nature into matters of literary psychology. When it comes to nature, everything is plastic. Or if your temperament and points of satisfaction are different, perhaps you disagree. And this, of course, would confirm, as James noted, 
that everything is in actuality plastic. Everything is plastic, a metaphor we've been fashioning narratives and creating poems for a very long time. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so I have a, um, a few comments. Um, my comments are going to be in essence, a summary of a summary, um, given that I have not uh, read um, these uh, summaries of the paper. I've been working with the original uh, paper, so please excuse any, uh, any overlap here. Uh, so, um, Professor Wallman takes on the task of probing this year's MSA's topic by reconsidering a critique offered by Santayana in his review of Dewey's experience in nature. She outlines Santayana's explicit rejection of a naturalistic metaphysics, in particular, the contradictory temperaments motivating the distinctions drawn between natural existence and human epistemological potential. As Professor Wallman explains, Santayana saw in naturalism a kind of humility regarding the impotence of human knowledge, demanding an appropriate piety before that which surpasses one's possible understanding. And in, metaphys in metaphysics, a kind of arrogance in supposing that all of nature can be assimilated into some human conceptual framework. However, Professor Wallman finds that Santayana's real argument is concerned with the difference between humanism and naturalism, insofar as naturalism tends to minimize human significance as subsumed within in the ultimacy of nature, and insofar as humanism tends to minimize the significance of nature by reducing nature to stories, including scientific accounts, as these stories are always interpretations based only on the features of nature open to human acquaintance. So for Santayana, naturalism and metaphysics are incompatible, if not contradictory. But even if Santayana's real objection were not to an incompatibility of metaphysics and naturalism, whether in terms of temperament or epistemological potential, uh, there are still problems. This is so for Professor Wallman because Santayana has on the one hand, a misguided or incomplete notion of naturalism. And on the other hand, a straw person account of humanism, one rooted in German idealism, including for Dewey, an identification Professor Wallman disputes. As I read Professor Wallman, Santayana's critique of the impossibility of a naturalistic metaphysics rests on what we can call a folk metaphysics. That is, if we take as what's really real, our common sense experience of objects and events in the world, things we push and pull and things that push and pull us, then we accept that nature is made up of, quote, substantial entities, processes of transformation and causal powers, end quote. Under this description of a naturalistic metaphysics, we find a logical contradiction in that, according to Santayana, the metaphysical just is such disembodied powers and immaterial factors prior to matter. So if we understand naturalism as committed to a materialist ontology growing out of a folk physics of substances, and if we understand metaphysics as an account of the immaterial, then naturalist metaphysics is oxymoronic at best. As detailed by Professor Wallman, Santayana rejects this false reasoning and instead uses the term metaphysics to mean, quote, a particular kind of focus on an appropriation of reality, end quote. This foregrounding places the metaphysical squarely within experience. And while the poet and others may appropriately engage in such foregrounding, for the metaphysician, quote, the human point of view is instead, uh, is treated as ultimate, end quote. Santayana then rejects this formulation of metaphysics as, quote, dissolving natural things into terms of discourse, end quote. Accordingly, Santayana's critique of naturalistic metaphysics is at least a critique of what he saw as the egocentrism of Dewey and James among others. That is the foregrounding of what appears in experience, whether in radical empiricism or transcendentalism, results in the quote, nullification of mind independent reality, 
But this is not yet the heart of Santayana's criticism of Dewey's naturalistic metaphysics. Instead, we need to return to the question of differences in temperament between the naturalist and humanist positions. A metaphysics that has as its fundament nature as it appears in experience demotes the world as over against experience to the world as it appears in our human accounts of it and succumbs to, quote, transcendental arrogance, end quote. Dewey's response is that Santayana's position of humility and piety before a nature that cannot be reduced to what shows up in human experience leaves us, quote, kneeling before the unknowable, end quote. If experience cannot account for nature in its own right, because experience is always only experience itself, then humanism and naturalism are in principle at odds. There is no nature to which we have access other than human nature. Professor Wallman goes into much more detail on the complex relations of concepts, themes, and temperaments within each thinker's work and those between the thinkers and those between the thinkers. And she concludes with the observation that Santayana's naturalism is distinguishable from those of, quote, dialecticians, transcendentalists, and scientific reductionists, end quote, while likely overplaying differences between his position and Dewey's. Her final remarks imply that perhaps Dewey and Santayana are not so far apart as it may seem. How we describe or think or feel about that in which we find ourselves points in both directions at once making, quote, even natural philosophy something humane, end quote. I think it might be useful to provide a slightly different context on the possible relations between naturalism and humanism, which I believe Professor Wallman regards as the fundamental bone of contention between Dewey and Santayana, even if their positions are closer than either assumed. There's a collection of essays uh, titled Naturalism and the Human Spirit. I don't know if it's, if it's widely known or widely read. Uh, the editor, Yervant Krikorkian, writes in the preface, quote, in this cooperative work, there are common agreements, not so much in specific ideas as in general attitudes. The method relied upon in seeking an understanding of the world is the empirical method of science. The world sought is the world of natural existence. These essays are also intensely concerned with the aspirations of the human spirit, its love of freedom, its sense of beauty, its hope for creating a better civilization." End quote. I'd like to suggest that the scientific or empirical method provides apt suggestions for what an adequate humanism looks like. Scientific endeavors show us that human knowledge is always partial, always fallible, always liable to bias, always perspectival, never absolute. The sciences also show us that some of our hypotheses lead to increases in our abilities to understand and manipulate features of the world in which we find ourselves. The sciences can also disabuse us of familiar and comforting assumptions we take as fundamental truths. This is not to say that we are closing in on some perfect understanding of nature. In fact, one of the special sciences, evolutionary biology, strongly suggests that true novelty is very likely a generic feature of nature, at least nature as it unfolds living things. So humanism that takes scientific inquiry seriously exhibits humility. Whether or not piety is appropriate is another matter though I think deference in the sense of recognizing epistemological finitude would be. Professor Wallman writes, quote, naturalism might assert that while nature is the ultimate object of a variety of stories about it, it nonetheless overflows all such tales in complexity and possibilities and its various features are not determined by how we depict it. The philosopher Sterling Lamprecht, uh, quoted by John Herman Mandel Jr. in Naturalism and the Human Sciences, uh, makes a similar suggestion 
though he reaches an additional conclusion. He writes, quote, the nature of anything may of course be, and probably is, probably always is, much more than it is empirically found to be. But the point of the argument is that everything is at least what it is given as in experience. Perhaps the form of humanism exemplified by many authors in this collection of essays is a candidate for what Professor Wallman calls for any more humane naturalism. Uh, so um, Professor Sturr describes his project clearly, quote, I seek to exhibit and to avow the pluralistic worldview or working attitude by focusing on a pluralistic and radically empirical view of nature, end quote. His essay does not serve as a defense of such a worldview, still less a proof. Instead, he hopes to quote, provide an opportunity for others to determine if this worldview resonates with, proves, proves useful in, and illuminates their own experience and lives, end quote. Professor Stirr's avowal and exhibition of this view of nature is, quote, one presented for your consideration, end quote. Professor Stirr goes on to provide what I experience as a linguistic performative act that refuses to settle into easy trajectories or facile deductions from premises that are themselves unstable and prone to slide from under us when we try to find a foothold. The essay itself is exhibited is, is exhibitive of James's claim that quote everything here is plastic end quote though even this is a bit hard to pin down as one meaning of plastic is that which is unnatural or not genuine but perhaps this was deliberate as you've read Professor Sturr's essay cannot be summarized neatly. Trying to do so would be a disservice to an essay that emphatically resists this. Rather, I hope my comments reflect an appreciation of the scope of what he offers while offering some thoughts on naturalism from my point of view. My remarks will neither exhibit nor avow, nor would they be systematic, which would counter the spirit of his work. The leisure demand on offer is so thoroughgoing that the nature of the title, that is some meanings of the word nature, blithely escapes any linguistic or conceptual net we may weave. The question, what is nature, becomes an invitation for an extended reverie on what is means in the question. So the avowal is, I take it, that experience independent nature always eludes us. This brings the conclusion one of the conclusions that he reaches, that the positions of non-reductive naturalists and radical empiricists differ in ways that are pragmatically indistinguishable, as neither can be, quote, proven, though they can be distinguished in terms of the temperaments of those who hold each position. For the naturalist, according to Professor Sturr, what unities we find in experience point to unities in the world independent of experience, affirmed by an animal faith that there is a greater and more permanent reality. Negatively, um, naturalism can be described as an adoration of matter, but also positively as displaying an attitude of humility and quote, reverence for the world, end quote, in light of human finitude. For the radical empiricist, the unities we find in experience give no evidence of nature independent of that experience. Experience is always and only found to be embedded in a network of experience. The satisfaction here seems to be in not being hoodwinked by the relata that doggedly appear as causes for experience, mistaking actualities for evidence of existence. Professor Sturr remarks that for the radical empiricist, perceptions, or I assume experience more generally, quote, can never warrant either belief or doubt in the existence, end quote, of something experience independent. Moreover, the principled uh, metaphysician must then refrain 
from making unverifiable inferences from what seems unassailable, my experience, to anything that cannot be experienced as anything other than experience. Professor Sturr writes that we should take the courageous stance, that we should take the courageous stance of recognizing that, quote, experience leans on nothing else. There is nothing else on which to lean only further experience, end quote. I think Professor Sturr is correct in saying that neither non-reductive naturalism, in the sense he understands it, nor radical empiricism can be proven. I think he's also correct in claiming that each is, quote, logically possible because not internally inconsistent and equally empirically unfalsified, though I would uh, substitute unfalsifiable. Professor Sturr distinguishes three broad perspectives on nature, non-reductive naturalism, radical empiricism, and anti-realist textualism. There is, I think, a fourth position, a subset perhaps of his first, that we can call hypothetical naturalism. I alluded to this early in my, sorry, I alluded to this early in my remarks about a philosophical metaphysical naturalism that is a generalization of the empirical method we find in the special sciences. Thinking that for the naturalist, nature is finished and somehow permanent does not fit this version. The naturalist need not approach nature in this way. Nature is just what we find, though not reducible to what we find. And what we find will always be limited, finite, perspectival, because that's the sort of creature we are. But what we find, if we're careful, can lead to hypotheses that guide us in uncovering more. There's no indication that there is an end to the process. As far as we can tell, nature is indefinite in scope. Moreover, a naturalist can agree with, with Professor Sturr's point about, quote, an always unfinished world, precarious and full of possibility. But again, the naturalist would take these as hypotheses, for this describes what we find. From what we can tell, there is novelty in nature, though novelty embedded in what is relatively more stable and persistent. Parenthetically, what the naturalist does find is extraordinarily strong evidence that at least some of the features of nature encountered in experience are accumulations of temporal processes that precede my existence and my experience. Uh, moreover, the naturalist might begin by pointing out that the impossibility of mind or experience independent nature lies in the fact that this very formulation answers its own question. If nature were to be mind or experience independent, by definition, nature would exclude any possible relations to experience. Professor Sturr uses definitions of metaphysical found in the OED, and he examines several of the many definitions of is articulated by Santayana. John Herman Randall Jr. opens the epilogue of naturalism and the um, human, uh, excuse me, naturalism and the human spirit, title of which is The Nature of Naturalism, in the following way, quote, in Baldwin's Dictionary of Philosophy, there are listed some 37 different meanings of the term nature in philosophic discussion. He then writes, now naturalism in the sense in which it is maintained in this volume can be defined negatively as the refusal to take nature or the natural as a term of distinction. It is opposed to all dualisms, between nature and another realm of being, to the Greek opposition between nature and art, to the medieval contrast of the natural and the supernatural, to the empirical antithesis of nature and experience, to the idealist distinction between nature, natural and transcendental, to the fundamental dualism pervading modern thought between nature and man. For present day naturalists, Nature serves rather as the all-inclusive category. It ceases to be a distinctive ism. 
it regards as natural whatever man encounters in whatever way. Perhaps this gloss on nature is covered by the first sense of is, addressed by Professor Stirr, that of identity. However, I don't think that that entails what Professor Stirr goes on to claim, quote, nothing more can be said about nature and nothing more needs to be said. What is nature? Nature is nature, end quote. There seems to me to be much more that can, than can be, that can be said. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we can um, open uh, the chat now. Wow, we've scared them all off. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if we're waiting for people to ask questions, I'd be happy to respond to the comments. As um, Would that be a good start or does somebody have a question? Betsy, I'm technologically incompetent. I'm trying to do with the chat, but, but I can't. Okay, so just ask your question. Thank you so <laughs> much. Th th thank you. I, I love this session. Um, you, your, your comments provoked a question, and I wonder why we give science so much credit. And so I want to all three of you, I, I think we should talk about the experimental temperament rather than the scientific method. And the reason why is because, because when Duke Ellington's sitting at the keyboard and playing with possibilities, I think he's, he's, ex, he's exhibiting the experimental temper. Mm -hmm. and, and the scientific method is but one expression or embodiment of that temperament. Uh, and and I, think in, I think what we need more is uh, in politics, in our, well, uh, across the board, um, is, is, is such a temperament. The other thing is very quickly, John, um, the friendliest of amendments, at one point uh, in your paper and in your presentation, you talk about uh, experience leading to actual experience. It forces us to infer other actualities. In my friendliest of amendment of, uh, and I, I learned this from you better than anybody else, I would have thought you would have said infer other actualities and possibilities. I, so the act, the the, the 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 absence of possibility there left me a, a little bit um, uh, confused. Thank you. Thank you for the papers. Great. Let me just real quickly, uh, Vinny. Yes, uh, possibilities included. Uh, you as a person, I think, would recognize that. So you can read that as uh, as the claim that possibilities are real, that firstness is real. Um, I agree with you entirely to think of experimental method as something that transcends what we think of as the natural sciences. Right? I, I see that actually in kind of Jamesian terms as experiential method, learning on the basis of past experience. Yeah, I, I think this point about experimental method might... Um or the experimentalism as opposed to the scientific method might actually approach, you know, get to a commonality between Santiana and James Dewey, all of them, and Peirce especially, which, you know, I, I can't help but assert over and over again, it's like, these were the philosophers who understood the experimentalism in science and thought it should apply more broadly to everything, right? So it's, it, my, any criticisms that I have of scientism or that Santayana had of scientism are about philosophers who treat the findings of science as religious truth almost, as the authority, the sort of medieval authority of the a priori method and then engage in deductive arguments. I think Santiana, Dewey, James, Peirce are all entirely sympathetic with, with everything Betsy is mentioning. I think dead on. I mean, the nature is not finished or permanent. I think they all agree on that. Um, Certainly, Santayana thought that human knowledge is only relatively, right, impotent. Human knowledge is impotent, like just the knowing, the having an idea, he thought, didn't change a physical object. That was the idea. That doesn't mean that we can't change physical objects. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten to Mars, right, for example. That doesn't mean that we can't make new things, right? So, I mean, he's got such a particular agenda, I think, that leads him to misunderstand and to characterize things in such a way, like he's, he's just gunning for the German idealists and he sees German idealism everywhere. 
And so I think it leads him to, to say things that make it sound as though he's somehow against, you know, um, human knowledge or striving or experimentalism, but I don't think that's at all the case. And then just one last thing I want to throw out um, about is, is since you brought up actuality, just in John's point about the is of identity, right? Santiago's got seven, <laughs> right? So the is of identity is strict identity. So John's absolutely right. Nature is nature, full stop. The, those other natures, that could be definition, predication, equivalence, we got tons more. Um, but, and so I think that's also why John brought up the is of actuality as opposed to possibility, because he's talking about conscious life. Santiago's talking about conscious life there when he talks about the is of actuality. As a, it's not supposed to be a distinction from possibility. Um, essence would be possibility. And now we'll shut up. Um, I will just very briefly uh, respond to Vinny's point. Uh, one, I think, I think the reluctance to uh, talk about science is that uh, I think we've been brainwash is too strong a word, but we take as the most sciencey of sciences, physics. And once we go down that road, then we can't know anything about anything, right? But I do think that using the word science is gives an important emphasis in that the scientific method, we can call it experimental if you like, but the scientific method has been very uh, well articulated by sciences by scientists over many centuries, the, what science is, is something that itself is um, is under scientific experiment, right? Trying to figure out exactly what it is that we're doing, what are the limits of this, and so on. So I mean science in a very, in a very broad sense. It would be more like, like query to get to. Um, I, I, I just want to lay the emphasis on experimental temperament in order to foreground the kinships that are over, often overlooked mm -hmm. between scientific endeavors and other endeavors. That's all. So Nancy has a question. Uh, thank you both for excellent papers, stimulating. And um, I was interested in the overlap uh, with Santayana, but I'm reluctant to boil everything down to temperamental differences. So John, this is a question for you. Help me with why am I uncomfortable with uh, letting it all go according to temperament as though you and I can shrug it off, you know, to each his or her own. Um, it's just a matter of temperament. I concluded a recent paper about Wesley Wildman, who also takes the Jamesian approach, that it's all a matter of temperament when you do metaphysics. And he distinguishes four, and he lumped me into a category, and I was uncomfortable with that. Anyway, uh, I'm trying to, to think about it because it comes up again and again in philosophy of religion, uh, where if you don't think there's such a thing as ultimate reality. It's a matter of temperament. You're, you're too analytical, or I think I was called an analytical dash aesthetic in my, in my philosophy um, by Wesley Wildman. Um, what do you think, John? Can you say anything more about the role of temperament in framing metaphysical visions? Yeah, um, right. The the snarky answer to your question about why you feel that way is it's just your temperament, right? But um, <laughs> the, the less snarky, right? The less snarky answer is I, I think it's a mistake to read somebody like James and say it's just temperament or it's all temperament uh, for two reasons. One is that that holds on to some notion of reason uh, that's without or independent of temperament. And certainly for somebody who writes an essay like The Sentiment of Rationality, that's a misunderstanding of the nature of reason, that there is a kind of non-affective reasoning going on here. I don't think that James believes that it's all temperament. I think he believes that, as he says in the first chapter of a pluralistic universe, that 
philosophy comes on the scene later, that we have working worldviews, that we have outlooks, that we have visions on life, and we turn to philosophy, some of us, some weird few of us turn to philosophy to express those. And we try, the philosopher tries to put those in a kind of rational argument form, right? So I, I wanna say that I think that as long as you have a kind of temperament-filled, sentiment-filled, affective notion of reason, then it's also all reason. But I would also say that if you look at this issue, this is certainly an issue that qualifies for the heading of seemingly interminable, right? And so one explanation is philosophers are just pretty stupid and that's why they haven't been able to settle this question, right? Another would be, well, we just need some evidence that we don't have yet. When we get that evidence, this will be settled. I don't think it's this kind of dispute. I don't think that's the nature of it. I think that historically, it doesn't appear to be that kind of empirical issue. So I would say that the, the claim that your temperament, that anyone here, <laughs> that their temperament, that their working attitude, that their vision of life, that the way they feel the world, that that is somehow separate from the philosophy they have, that seems to me to be not empirically uh, verified. Uh, a couple of things quickly. I'm struck by, in this talk and in uh, Larry's talk, how extraordinarily we have incorporated Quine to be is to be the value of a bound variable, or William James's version, the varieties of religious experience, where humanists, by the virtue of the way we talk to one, to be is to be a topic of discourse or a, a matter of experience. Physics, metaphysics is that which comes after the physics. And it isn't the same physics as Aristotle. So to talk about push-pull is well and good, but it's a different physics now. So I have this question for John and for Jessica. What is physics for you? What do physicists do that philosophy doesn't do? Sure, I can take this first. Um, what does physics do? I would say, so just physics, or do we get to include, as, as you, Betsy you pointed out, by, you could, Biology too, the okay. people who invented the vaccines, for example. Excellent. I would say those are the um, practices that enable us better than any other practices I know, at, know about to get at uh, the most regular and predictable features of nature. So what do they that, engage? What do they engage? Yeah. In my, from my Santian opinion. Uh, Whatever. They, so the sciences engage in the material, engage material reality. <laughs> I see. How about you, John? What do they engage? I have a feeling it's going to be different. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what that word engage means, David, but they, I assume you don't mean that they engage their colleagues and so on, but they as a community uh, engage certain problems. Problems? And, and they try to use the methods that have been shown to be most effective in solving those problems. Problems and methods, but what about the material world that they engage. What is right, so the physicist deals with some part of that and the chemist deals with another part of that and the biologist with yet another part and there's some overlap. Where is that in your uh, account of experience? Is that a uh, thing to experience or is that somehow defined entirely or explained entirely by that which is available to us within experience? Yes. Jessica made a point before in, in uh, naming a succession of philosophers, including Peirce, but Peirce doesn't belong in that list. Peirce had, had a theory of abduction in which you infer to the conditions for that which you experience, but which is not itself known directly to experience, but is nevertheless specifiable. Absolutely. Could not agree with Peirce more. You don't? You do? I see. And where- I agree with, I agree with Peirce entirely on that. And where is that within the experiences you were describing? I think that the logic of forming hypotheses is a key part of experimental method. But it's, it's not just the hypothesis, it's that which the hypothesis specifies, which is not within experience. Yeah, it's, of course it is. If it weren't within experience, it would not be known, David. No, it, spe it specifies that whose effects are within experience, but that which lies outside experience. As your brain, our brains lie outside of experience, though showing something of themselves within experience. We have a different view of our brains. I don't think my brain lies outside experience. All of it? <laughs> All of my experience? 
All of it? Is all of it within experience? My ex yes. See, Would Nancy? You? No. <laughs> this is why. No, I think that makes my point. Uh, it's not a matter of, of temperament. It sounds exactly like a matter of temperament. I see two very different temperaments. Oh, it's, it's, uh, the differences between David and John are imposed by if the I could, conditions uh, of our cognitive situation. If I could interrupt for just a moment, we do have a couple more folks who wanted to get in on the conversation. Uh, so uh, Nick here has a question and uh, George has a question and then Jason has a question. So Nick, you have the floor. Thank you. So, I mean, this is totally, I was thinking this in the beginning before all these questions, but it's totally related. And I was originally going to direct it at you, Jessica. Um, so I was thinking that while temperament might be at play in our theories or in our metaphysics across the board, that would you agree that not all temperaments or psychological dispositions are equal? That I'll give the example of an open mind versus a closed mind. Different temperaments, but an open mind is going to be able to more authentically engage with the world and its possibilities and its meanings. And so I would think that a scientifically minded or experimentally minded philosopher, scientist, whoever, um, you know, can, is, is utilizing a kind of open-minded mentality. Yes, it's a temperament, but that's not the same temperament as a closed mind that might prevent us from coming to know the world. Yeah, I think, okay, so let me say a couple of things in response to that that I think are, that's very helpful as a way of clarifying, I think, a couple of points. So point one, I think I want to stress that I believe both John and I in talking about temperaments are not trying to reduce everything in the world to temperaments or all inquiry to temperaments, but are specifically talking about a particular philosophical disagreement about what nature means, right? And that at some point, so to think about William James's point in, in the will to believe, if this is a matter that cannot be decided intellectually, and I don't agree, Nancy, I don't think this is an intellectual dispute about whether every, about our brains are closed off from experience. I think it has to do with what you mean by experience, what you mean by closed off. Um, that, that it's going to be the temperament in your own language, right? The person that wants to risk truth rather than avoid failure that will affect how nature seems to them. So that's, that's thing one, that we're, so I'm narrowing the scope of talking about temperament being uh, as a way of accounting for a difference in philosophical worldview that I don't think either John or I thinks is intellectually solvable. So that's thing one. Thing two, I am entirely sympathetic to the notion of an uh, open mind being better than a closed mind, but as a good pragmatist, then I want to say for what end, right? So of course, you know, as a professor <laughs> and as someone who thinks that uh, believes in meliorism, and I think that we can improve the world, that and there are practical and there are practical consequences uh, in both Peirce and James's sense of the word that show that that will lead to better conclusions and Dewey's sense of flexible habits than a closed mind. But if somebody's goal is um, the desire to get to their eternal reward and those who don't abide by certain dogmas will fail to get there, I don't know if there is such an eternal reward, but if that's the goal, the people who espouse that may believe that what you, you and I would call a closed mind would be the best temperament, temperament at all, of all. So, I think the question of what's a good temperament, what's a bad temperament may already show that there are some working as some temperamental assumptions uh, that we have going on. Thanks. Okay, if I could, um, I believe this session, uh, we can check for one second. Uh, this session has concluded, but uh, as we don't have any group activities after this, I would at least, if we could, those of you who can stay, I know that uh, George has a question, Jason has a question, and I saw Tyler with a hand up. So if we could um, hear from uh, George first. I'm not quite sure that you can make any distinctions between temperament and rationality. Uh, somehow or another, they're at least so interdependent that I, uh, 
can't think of a person who is engaged in an intellectual activity of some cognitive, even, even physicists, that as deeply involved with their emotional and temperament, I take it as part of an emotional response to things, so that I don't think you can pull these apart. And you're behaving as though they were quite distinct sort of things. Uh, let me just say one thing, and George. I'm not sure I understood your. I'm not sure if I understood your comment, but I, I'm behaving as if they're the same. They they are interdependent. Right. I don't, I don't know that there's a possible yeah, way to. That, that's what that's what I was saying. That is, and also got a rational aspect to it. Yes, that, right. that that was the view I was putting out. Okay, that's what you wanted me to say. I'm sorry <laughs> I didn't say it earlier. No, thank you. <laughs> I agree. Jason, if you're still with us, would you care to make your comment? Thank you for your, the presentation. It's good to see you all. Um, Professor Stir, I have a question for your paper. Uh, it concerns the difference between uh, a defense of metaphysics and a justification of metaphysics. So I, uh, I noticed the numerous parts in your paper where you're talking about how worldviews are not systems, um, demanding thought universally in the terms, therefore there's no need to mount a defense of such a demand. And though I agree with that particular claim, what about the justification of worldviews in the public sphere? So justification goes beyond mere adequacy, coherence, or clarity. This would pertain to the defense of a metaphysics, and it moves into the sphere of social and ecological praxis, for example, ethics, politics, collaboration across or within worldviews, or working toward common goals. So how do we evaluate the practical consequences of various worldviews? In other words, is there a normative ground or principle or context that would allow for the relative judgment of different worldviews? Yeah, absolutely, right? So on my view, not surprisingly, this is normative all the way down, right? And so what I said in the paper was that it was not possible to offer a proof, and I meant that in a fairly technical way. It's not possible to offer a proof that's not question begging. There are no criteria by which we can assess metaphysical theories that are not already themselves relative to some metaphysical theory. Right? So when I claim in the paper that it's not possible to provide a proof, that's what I mean. That's something very different from talking about justifying the view. Now, what counts as justification is going to be context dependent, right? In terms of, are we talking about a certain kind of political problem? Are we talking about a kind of environmental problem? But also I want to just stress, it depends upon what you mean by we, <laughs> right? So sorry to put it that way, because what some people will hear as justification, other folks won't. Right? And so part of the political uh, issue that we face today, for example, uh, which I think resonates a bit with some of the things that Betsy was saying, is that we have a lot of people who don't seem to buy into Peirce's notion of experimental method. They seem to rely on a priori methods or methods of authority or Donald Trump telling them what to shoot into their arm or why you shouldn't wear a mask. Right? And so what counts as justification there, if you mean by that sort of persuasion, is one thing. If you mean by that what they take as reason, that's another thing. But yes, I think that's absolutely crucial. Larry had a question. Well, I just, this is a question for John, which, you know, I'm sure he knows is coming. So um, was there a world before there was experience? Yeah, experience shows us that that's so. So it was before. So what you mean is there, if experience shows us that there's something that exists independently of experience, then it does exist independently of experience. Um, Larry, you're confusing existing before with being independent. The temporal order is only one possible relation. I'm, uh, I think existing before would have been independent, let's say, like before there were any human beings around. So if we claim, we've got evidence now that there was this stuff that was here, like a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot. And it yeah. was here before human beings who are pretty recent. Now, if you, I say they were here before human experience was here, you say, oh, that doesn't contradict what I say because it's human experience that's showing it was there. but. The human experience is showing it was there before that is independent of. No, so this is, uh, this reminds me of uh, 
the essay that William James wrote responding to Bertrand Russell, who asked whether James believed that there was a period in which there were dinosaurs before there were human beings. Right? And so the question that you're asking is a good question. Bertrand Russell asked it. William James gave a full uh, response to it. I'm not sure that I can do more than that. But to claim I think, that something, I to think claim James is, I think James, since James was a realist, I think James's view made sense. James's view is that there was a period of time uh, before there were human beings. Yes. Yes. That does not mean that it's, and James is very clear, it's not therefore independent of experience. Independence is always contextual. It's independence with respect to what? Dependent with respect to what? Right. So you can't talk about independence as a block. You have to talk about it relative to what? It's a relational term. Nothing is independent. It's independent of something. But okay, saying that something you're saying only cons fine. Your concern is independent, whether there is independence of humanity. So we can just keep with that one if you want. Whether there's something that's independent of humanity. Yeah, it's not independent of humanity. It existed prior to humanity arrival. Oh, oh, but that's not independent. No, or if you want, Larry, that's independence if you want to specify it as meaning prior to. But that's not the only notion of, of independence and dependence. Can oh, I sure help me true. offer one clarification? Wait, so, but let, let me just say one help. other thing, which is okay. just to connect, right? Which is what I, which you will not be surprised, right? So this is the question you'll think is coming, right? Which is what I think is mistaken in your view of an asymmetrical dependence in your paper. It's only asymmetrical from one standpoint. From other standpoints, other levels are primary. The question of what counts as dependence depends upon what sort of relation we're talking about. Well, if you if the the kind of dependence I was talking about was that you can't have a a cell without certain chemicals, and until those chemicals came into existence. Be a cell. Yeah, and I but I think that all pragmatists would agree with that. I'd like to break in for just a second. Jessica is Jessica would like to get in on this conversation. I think because I've had these arguments so many times since I got married <laughs> that I want to make one clarification that I've learned when I in utter frustration. I was talking to Brian Henning, and I'm so sorry he's not here. Uh, apparently. I said, what is this thing about empiricists every time I say independent of experience? What are they hearing? And they're hearing utterly unrelated to any experience in principle. It's like Hegel's super sensible world or something. So when John is saying not independent of, he means no, of course it's not in, uh, completely and utterly unavailable to experience. Otherwise we wouldn't have discovered dinosaurs. But that's not what Larry means by independent. And I think right. the difference in the connotation of independence is what is sparking the dis. dis I, I bow to this wisdom. Thank you. Marriage is important. I have learned a lot. And and we can only add that whatever we we mean by independent of et cetera et cetera, it can only be described dependent on perspective. Sounds good to me. I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Melvin, by the way, has been raising his hand for a while. I think. I'm. I'm troubled by the balance between epistemology and ontology here. It just seems to me that the, the perspective that's being taken is one that, that places epistemology completely dominant over ontology. And the epistemology is one that doesn't, I think, give sufficient uh, attention to, to postulation and to concepts by population. Mm -hmm. I did start out to be a geologist, so I had exactly Lawrence's thing. What do we do with the Precambrian? And to say that the Precam that the reality or the existence of the Precambrian is dependent upon our way of finding out about it seems to me to put the cart before the horse. But it, it's, it's the general sense that somehow we've got to solve the epistemological problems, and that's the only way to get at reality. And here I go with David Weissman. I think that gives, puts him in a terrible position with respect to neutrinos. Uh, 
there was a certainty about neutrinos. People then had to, to, to you know, bury some gas in a mine 4,000 feet deep. That was all the experimental stuff. But that experimental stuff depended on some powerful postulational conceptions that themselves are- Yeah, part. I'm not sure where anybody sees either one of us is disagreeing with that. So that's, that's the part that- Well, I was having me. trouble following you because I was worried about the pre-Cambrian. No, I, I think that we're, if anything, what we're stressing is not that you have to get the epistemology right, but that this particular epistemological, epistemological battle is, is stillborn. That we cannot, there's no winning the fight over between naturalism and uh, non-reductive naturalism and radical empiricism. That, that there is an element that both fields take science seriously but interpret the, the players in the scientific method differently. And not in any way that's different regarding taking seriously the results of science. Okay. That's what I would want to stress, I think. Okay. I think I, and so when I said purse, I put person with those. I don't, I'm not saying purse thinks everything's induction by any means. I said purse is a scientist and he was radically challenging the modern epistemology that preceded him as being hopelessly indifferent and to an ignorant of scientific method, which of course involves uh, abduction. Otherwise, how do you formulate a scientific uh, experiment in the first place? Okay, thank you. Benami Sharfstein, who is a pragmatist of a sort, wrote a fantastic book that illustrates exactly this conversation in this session. It's a book called The Dilemma of Context. And it's written from a very nuanced and very liberal pragmatist position. It's fascinating with gazillions of examples, some of which have been uh, exemplified, exemplified here. It's a fan, it's a fa absolutely fantastic book uh, that handles the issue of context, temperament, alternative frameworks. He ends up in a certain sense saying that in many cases, our arguments revolve or resolve into musical temperaments from one point of view, but he tries to escape from the mere relativism of this by specifying exactly the types of contexts that either block under our mutual understanding or enable it. But it, it's also an argument against universalism or against universal frameworks. So it, it issues a challenge to us of trying to figure out, do we ever really fully gain control over our attempts to construct these frameworks that can uh, fight the battle against all comers, so to speak, and why we cannot be ever fully convinced or why we can never fully convince someone else. But it's a, it's a very fascinating, fascinating book, very challenging book, The Dilemma of Context. It looks to me it's backwards, but whatever it is, uh, I don't know how it appears to you. But uh, I think it bears, it would bear discussion for a whole session at another time uh, uh, and to try to figure out exactly where one goes in the light of that. But uh, that's a, a bibliographical comment, uh, which I'm uh, very much in favor of though, uh, in terms of his argument. Well, thank you for the reference. I will check it out for sure. Yes, thank you. Um, any last uh, comments or questions? Uh, Michelle, did you want to uh, speak to your comment? Um, okay, thanks. I'll be very quick. Um, I just was um, trying to say that I, I think David's point was correct earlier. Um, Person's abduction exists to posit a theory about laws, laws of physics, laws of biology. It doesn't matter. And that Theory is always falsifiable, but we have a working method by which we can make intelligible sense of the world. And we go with that working method, which is then falsifiable. It doesn't fall in an area of permanent reality and temperament. It's neither of those things, right? This is, this is a pragmatic science that first rests on a abductive method, I would say. I, I stand to be corrected, but I, I think that's, I read that to be David's point. And it's, what I, I read it to be everybody's point. I'm not sure who's hearing anything different. Right. That's the part I don't get. Because the specification of reality as reduced to either discourse or empirical experience 
doesn't follow if you accept that point. I'm not going to take the side of the radical empiricist. I was just saying that I didn't say Peirce was a radical empiricist. <laughs> okay. Um, any last last questions or comments? Hi, it's Alabasu here. I'm I, just jumping in at the end. I'm not a member of your society. I'm just very privileged to be here and listen to all of this. I was wondering, does it change anything if having an idea changes physical objects? Because I think it does. I think the ideas that we've been exchanging today have changed physical objects, which is the structure of our brain. Of course. It depends on what you mean by the having of the idea. Is that having of the idea um, represented uh, neurologically by changing synaptic strengths and connections? Sure. Yeah. So it does change something? What does it change? Does it, well, does it change something in your example. arguments or it doesn't change anything in your argument? Having so an was, idea, depend, uh, yeah, I just said, I agreed with you. Sure, yeah. but having an idea that the world is a certain way doesn't make the world a certain way. That is what, what the, I think the naturalist would say, at least, and that's what Santayana criticizes the uh, humanist metaphysicians for. He thinks, I'm not saying he's right. He thinks that human constructions of reality are the world, right? So the phenomenological, in fact, we actually had an argument like this, a bizarre argument at, at uh, Emory when someone, about whether there was one world or multiple worlds um, in a job talk recently when someone came in, one person was insisting, no, there's one world and we're all understanding it differently, but we're in this together. And that's why we have to understand each other. And the other people from a phenomenological standpoint were like, no, 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 we're not in the same world at all. We're all in different worlds. And he kept saying, yeah, I know what you mean, but we're, I say we're in one world. And it went back and forth and we got absolutely nowhere, right? So Santayana's point, rightly or wrongly, is that, that there's a world, there's, a re there's an existence that we know through in various many different kinds of ways. Um, and he's criticizing philosophers that he thinks are asserting that their stories about the world are themselves tantamount to the world and that people can have simply irreconcilable worlds and there's nothing more to which those worlds refer. And that's not the honest criticism. I'm, again, I'm not saying that, but that I've seen it at work in a job talk. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. I can certainly leave this room open. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, no, thank you, Alia. Thanks, Betsy.